Yeah, so uh, about a year, well, about <laughs> a year ago, <laughs> I got together with two really good friends and started uh, Cross Culture Ventures. Cross Culture Ventures is a early stage venture capital fund um, based out of San Francisco and Los Angeles. And um, our thesis is around uh, culture. And so basically our belief is that uh, global culture or pop culture uh, molds brands and brands define the experiences that we, that we have every day. Uh, so what we aim to do is to understand um, and identify trends um, before they become trends and find entrepreneurs that are building companies that cater to those trends. Um, and if we do that, our, you know, we feel like we'll be investing in the next big, uh, big brands of tomorrow, uh, just like a, a Google or a Facebook or, or whatever you, you want to call it. So um, I think it's interesting that you were at Intel before uh, starting this fund. Um, Intel is one of the earliest investors in our ecosystem. So they were early investors in some of the kind of key brands in the region, but have since retreated. Right? They are no longer an active participant in the local market. Um, I think it's worthwhile uh, if you could tell us a bit more about your experience at Intel, how they approached um, investing, and how that's kind of shifted um, it, uh, at, the, at your new fund. Um, so I'm going to stay away from talking about Intel too much, because I'm not, I'm not there anymore. I'm yeah. not a sp spokesperson for them. Um, what I will say is that I had, you know, four incredible years there. Um, it is a, it, it is an organization with a with a global focus. It's also um, an organization that's going to invest based on what's strategically relevant um, to them. So most of the decisions uh, that they make around um, investing is what's good for and relevant to Intel's core business. So that could give you a sense of yep. why or or why not. Yep. There investing and not investing in certain yeah. um, areas. And do you feel a big difference between um, kind of corporate VC to fund VC? Um, is, that, is, that, is, is that a big shift, do you think? Is there anything you would potentially um, kind of advise uh, the entrepreneurs in the audience about what's different when approaching a corporate VC versus uh, uh, a, uh, a, a normal kind of fund VC, mm -hmm. GPLP VC? Mm -hmm. Um, two main things come to mind. Uh, one is the strategic relevance aspect, right? So corporate VCs are only, well, Google is the only one that does this a little bit different, and we know them well because they're partners in our, um, to our fund, um, Cross Culture. But other, outside of Google, um, every other corporate venture firm, they're not going to make investments unless that business can help their, um, their, their main business or some of their emerging businesses in some way. There has to be some type of strategic relevance there for them to justify the investment. Because <clears throat> even with a, you know, a, a large venture, um, a corporate venture firm like Intel Capital, um, the returns that they're going to see from that venture vehicle is minuscule compared to the revenue that they see with the, other, the main part of their business. Right? So you got to put that in perspective. Um, so the advice that I would give there is to make sure that whatever it, it is that you're building makes sense for that, for that corporate entity. Um, the other big difference is um, time. Um, it's going to be a slower process uh, just because there's just so much, there's so much bureaucracy. It's a, it's a big company, so you have to go through that. Whereas um, institutional venture firms, they tend to be partnerships, most of them uh, somewhat small, and can make uh, nimble decisions and, and move quickly. And you kind of have to move quickly to, to, to remain competitive in the, in the space. Um, shifting gears a bit to cross-cultural VC, um, can you tell us a bit more about the kind of uh, overarching thesis, how you're approaching trends, what do you think is really exciting, and, and, and what you've done to date so far? Sure. Um, so I already, I, Jesus, I already said, um, you know, the, the, <laughs> the way we think about it is that um, culture is, it's a proxy for consumer behavior, right? So what we're looking for are shifts in, in consumer behavior. 
and we're trying to identify those shifts early. To, to give you some examples, um, you know, some, some legacy investments for our fund are uh, Uber, Lyft, and Spotify. Um, if, you, if you take the, the Uber and, and, and Lyft um, examples, what are, the, what are the cultural shifts or behavioral shifts that, that they're benefiting from? Um, one, it's just the proliferation of the internet and, and mobile phones, right? It's, it, it's creating a, um, a concept of on demand. I want what I want right now. I don't want to wait until, until later. I want to push a button and I want to get it. But then there are also other things, particularly in the, in the U.S., right? Um, uh, college education is expensive. So after you graduate, you're, um, you're kind of forced to, to move to, to Metropolitans because that's where you're going to get the largest paychecks so that you can pay back those student loans. Um, so then what happens is those, those uh, metros, they start um, getting over, overly crowded, right? And as they get overly crowded, it becomes difficult to own vehicles. Um, it's also, it also becomes you know, um, supply and demand, right? So as there's a greater demand, the, the cost um, goes up because the supply is not, not going up. The city is, is only so big. Um, so the cost of living in these cities go up. Another reason why it, it's, it becomes more difficult to, to own cars. So enter an, an Uber, which allows you to um, travel around, usually in, in, in style if you choose to. There are different classes of cars you can you can use. Um, it's on demand. You can get it when, when you want to, and it's affordable. Um, so there you have, you know, three or three or four uh, significant cultural shifts that this company is, um, is basically uh, has become successful because it's capitalized on, on those shifts. Um, Airbnb is a, another one, right? Without the internet, without being able to be comfortable with, um, with strangers, essentially. Uh, there's no way that many people would open up their, their homes and rent them out to, to people that they don't know. Um, but you know, Airbnb, you're seeing something like one million rooms um, occupied um, globally per night. Um, and that's, you know, those, are, those are cultural shifts. So those are the types of things that, that we look for um, in, in our company. So we're, we work, uh, we have a partnership with a, a really large uh, marketing firm that um, has a presence in about 180 countries. And um, we, we get consumer insight from that and uh, kind of distill it uh, down into something that, that, that we, can, we can digest. And then we go off and, and look for in, interesting companies that are doing things in and around um, those trends. Um, thinking about these cultural shifts, um, what are what are the next wave of cultural shifts that you think are going to be uh, attractive to entrepreneurs to capitalize on? So, what do you really think is the next wave after this kind of initial sharing economy businesses such as Airbnb and Uber? Well, I don't think it's I don't think it's over yet. Actually, um, you know, we're looking at in the in the transportation space, for instance, uh, shared shared economy. We're looking at a company that's that's looking to disrupt. Um, the way that you rent cars, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, particularly in, in some parts of the of the U.S. and, and of the world, um, Uber and Lyft won't work. Yeah. You still need to run a car. Yeah. And so, um, you know, fixing that um, uh, that challenge is a is is a big opportunity. Um, for instance, uh, the thinking of Spotify, the uh, download to streaming mm -hmm. um, space, right? That's not, you know, you have Spotify, you have um, uh, Pandora, and and a couple title and and a, and a few others, um, but there's still there's still other models that are that are coming about, um, and it that day hasn't been won yet. Okay. Um, so so there's still a lot more more work to be done there. Um, you know, another place we're looking is around um, uh, SMS, okay. text messaging as a as a form of communication. A uh, company we recently invested in out of uh, Kenya is uh, called uh, Mobile Survey or M Survey, and they allow brands to um, speak to their existing customers as well as prospective customers through through SMS. And they're seeing, um, you know, they're seeing uh, response rates for uh, for their surveys in the range of 
25 to 55 percent, where typically in the, in the survey space, it's single digit um, response rates. And it's because um, texting is becoming uh, the de facto uh, means of communication. It, in some places, it feels more natural to send a text message than it is to pick up the phone and, and say hello. Cool. Um, are there any, um, just to bring it back to our part of the world, is there, are there any specific areas that you find are particularly interesting in emerging markets or more interesting in emerging markets that maybe the disruption or impact is going to be more acute? Yeah, so uh, um, I think the, the, the messaging one is, 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 is still a, a mm -hmm. pretty big one. Um, I'm going to bring it up a level. Yeah. And I think what, what entrepreneurs in general uh, should focus on is um, their own experiences and um, the uniqueness of, of, those, of those experiences and those challenges and go after um, finding, finding unique ways to, uh, to tackle those challenges. That the entrepreneurs that go after, authentically go after um, challenges that they're very, very familiar with are typically the, the more successful ones. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can do that and you know, identify a, a, a challenge that you know, starts local but has the, um, um, the, the, the capacity or, or um, can become more of a, a global play, those are the types of, of companies um, we're, we're most interested in. Cool. Uh, we um, so we're this this dynamic of local versus global is something that um, in our fund at Wanda Capital we're particularly interested in. We don't see many companies that are able to sc scale globally um, from the region, right? They are typically very local plays. Um, what do you think a company? A do you think it's possible to kind of scale a business from an emerging market to a global to become a global product? Um, and, and what's needed to really make that happen? What do you think are kind of the key ingredients to that? Um, I definitely think it's, it's, it's possible. Um, there, there are examples of it. Um, you know, uh, Digicel, for instance, is, is a, um, I keep going back to the Caribbean because that's where I'm from, but um, you know, it's, a, it's a mobile carrier, mm -hmm. right? That's definitely yeah. a, a global, global problem, right? And, and they've basically monopolized um, the cell phone industry in, in the Caribbean and are starting to grow outside mm -hmm. of that. So uh, yeah, I, I definitely think it's, it's, it's possible. Um, what I'd say is, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, um, you know, look at these, look at these um, challenges and start to test them uh, kind of immediately and rapidly, your, your thesis around it. And, um, you know, look outside of your, uh, you know, <laughs> Comfort zone. Yeah, your your comfort zone um, and your in your current location, and, and to see if there's any um, applicability for whatever it is that you're building outside of your of your locale, and um, go after big problems. If you go after go after big problems, it, it it's just more attractive, right? If you look at it from a, a venture investor perspective, you know we we will never invest in in an idea unless it's big enough to return our fund, right? Mm -hmm. In, in the venture space, you're probably, your fund is usually returned with one or two deals, even if you're invested in 40, 80, right? So you want to make sure that every, and you, don't, you never know which one of those 40 or 80 companies is going to be that, that, yeah. that one that's going to um, drive the return. So you go after everyone thinking that this one is big enough to, mm -hmm. to, to return the fund. And so if, you're, if your local market is not a huge market. Um, that's not going to be something that's attractive to, to the venture industry. Uh, so it's got to it's got to scale out, mm -hmm. outside of that. Great. The the other the other um, ways you can think about this, um, you know, just going back to the, the whole Uber conversation. You know, you you have you're having um, competitors or um, kind of me too players in different parts of, of the world, mm -hmm. and that can be a successful strategy. Uh, because at some point, um, it's going to become easier to 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 buy, um, yeah. you know, that type of company as opposed to um, starting over in that in that um, geography. So it's another way to think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think with that, 
uh, we'd like to next open the open it up to questions from the audience. So if anyone has a question, you can start here. Um, so I, I don't know that social or, or impact, um, if it has to be different than um, for-profit venturing, right? There are a lot of companies that, um, uh, you know, that, that can fill, fill both buckets, right? Um, a lot, one, one of our companies, uh, a company called um, AfroStream, it's, uh, we call it the, the Netflix for um, African American and African content uh, distributed um, in Africa and in Europe in, in French. Um, what's interesting about them or what, what um, the impact play for them is that um, for independent artists that are creating this type of content, they're now going to have a platform that they can, they, they can launch on. And um, historically, it's been a challenge for uh, uh, certain demographics to launch um, launch content uh, widely. So, yeah. But I don't think it's different. In, in terms of what we look for, um, again, really large markets, um, you know, uh, something that's at the beginning of, of a shift that, um, that, that we believe in. We look for in, incredible founders, um, pr particularly because we're, we're starting at the seed stage um, in most cases, in some cases, Series A the company will likely change form a few times. So you want to make sure that you're betting on a team that is capable of looking at uh, what's going on in the world around them, the, the markets around them, and making the adjustments to the business so that, um, so that it goes with, with the rest of the world and continues to, to, to perform well. Uh, so, so we definitely look for, for strong founders, big markets, differentiated ideas and um, sustainably differentiated, right? So what are you doing, you know, is, the, is there something about your technology that's going to make it very difficult for um, others to, to copy what you're, what you're doing? Or is there something about your process that's gonna make it difficult for others to, um, to, to copy or to eat your lunch, as we, as we say? Those are the main things we look for. Cool. Ahsan? Yeah. Yep, go for it. Well, it is. It is. What's, what's driving all that? What's driving all that stuff? Exactly what you just said. It's, the, it's, it's consumer behavior. Culture is, consumer behavior is culture. That's right. I'm saying they're synonymous. They're the one and the same, basically. The back, yeah. So, how did you, what do you think about the difference between a DC that is done outside of the States and DCs that is done in Africa? And what is the difference that you have seen as a result of investing in SAE in DC? So, I haven't in invested in Egypt yet. Um, uh, I'll say the difference between, the main difference between the company we invested in in Africa and even the company we invested in in, in, in France, as opposed to the, um, to the US companies, they tend to, to burn less. So they, um, they, they spend more. Cost of living in those places are uh, a little bit less than it, than it is to live in Silicon Valley. Uh, so salaries are, are, are less. Um, so you can have a, um, a similar caliber company um, that, that can do a lot more um, with the with the, with your investment, I think that's probably uh, the, the the biggest difference. The other thing um, would is just perspective, right? Um, it's it's nice to 
it's nice to see new problems um, being being addressed and, and real problems being addressed. I think you know one of the challenges with investing in, in Silicon Valley is that um, you know a lot of the companies are building solutions that are relevant to that bubble, right? As opposed to being relevant to the the world. And uh, when you look outside of um, you know offshore, you, you get more of um, folks looking at at what we call real problems. Do you have anyone else? Okay. Well, just as a final thought, I think it would be uh, really interesting if you could share with the, the audience uh, what you're most hoping to get out of this trip to Egypt and to Cairo and, and from attending this conference. Yeah. Uh, just to meet as many entrepreneurs as, as possible, um, understand what, you know, what are, what are some of the... Um, the, the, the challenges or, or solutions that, that you're thinking about. Um, in an ideal scenario, you know, I'd, I'd leave with at least one, uh, one company or one entrepreneur that we would, you know, seriously um, talk to about making an investment or at least begin that conversation. Great. So, so for the entrepreneurs looking to raise money, I think... <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Thank yeah. you for being our guest today. And thank you. Thank you.